Thank you for being with us this evening. I'm Fadia Desmond, and I'm a very proud STEP graduate from the class of 1995. I'm also oh, all of my uh, fellow STEP alums out there. Uh, I'm also chair of the GSE's Alumni Awards and Recognition Committee. I have the honor of working with a very talented and very devoted group of GSE alums and also faculty, many of whom are um, lining the sides and also our faculty here in the audience with us. We have a very challenging job every year, uh, but it's incredibly rewarding, and that is the work we do in looking at the many uh, nominations that come in for uh, this award, the Alumni Excellence in Education Award. One very special thing about tonight is it actually marks our fifth year of honoring GSE alumni in this way with this award. So it's our five-year anniversary this evening, so I want to make mention of that. <laughs> it's also a great pleasure this evening to introduce you all to our dean, Dan Schwartz. Dan is the I. James Quillen Dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Education and the Nomalini and Olivier Professor of Educational Technology. A member of the Graduate School of Education faculty since 2000, Dan studies student understanding and representation, and he's a leading expert in the ways that technology can facilitate learning. In fact, he was the first scholar to take findings from neuroscience research and use them to change classroom practices. His work is grounded in practice from his career as a teacher, he is a world-class researcher whose scholarly work is cited over 1,000 times a year. He's highly respected by his GSE and Stanford faculty who view him as a leader with deep integrity and compassion. And he truly cares about creating meaningful learning experiences that are satisfying and empowering for all kinds of teachers and students. Please join me in welcoming Dean Schwartz. Uh, welcome. So after that introduction, I, I feel like I should get an alumni award, uh, <laughs> except that I didn't get admitted to Stanford. <laughs> so oh, it shows there's hope. Uh, so thank you, Fadja. Um, so as you heard, this is our fifth annual alumni award. And uh, so Alex is our first polls. Uh, awardee. Gloria will be our first visiting Ryle Scholar awardee. She will also be the first visiting Ryle Scholar. Uh, Irene is our first early career and <laughs> it's gonna be a long night <laughs> but a happy one so it's okay. And uh, Larry is our first faculty winner so uh, congratulations. So uh, we're, we're very proud to honor their contributions to education. And in fact, I've said this at every one of these, this is like the best event ever. It's very rare that you get so many people in the same room and they're all proud of each other. It's, it's a wonderful thing. And so it's, it's a warm event. You're really going to enjoy, enjoy hearing about it. So these four scholars and teachers uh, exemplify the best of the Stanford Graduate School of Education. So I like to tell people that our foundational value is that we do rigorous work that is both daring and relevant. And I could say the same about these honorees. Uh, they're all extraordinary, tackling some of the greatest challenges in education. They're leading the way to create more equal educational opportunities. Uh, they're helping to improve lives through learning. So uh, it's wonderful. So I want to tell you a little bit about this award. Uh, so this award was created by alumni for alumni. And I just want to describe the process a little bit. Uh, people nominate uh, awardees, potential candidates, and, and a committee of alumni looks at them. And they take this very tough job, because they're all amazing, and then they reduce it to 10 people. And then I get this list of 10 people, and I'm supposed to reduce it to six. And it's sort of like you're looking at an ice cream sundae <laughs> Or do you want a root beer float with nuts? It, it's sort of an impossible decision because everybody's extremely good, right? And so as I try and remind the committee, uh, if they don't get it this time, they can get it next time. There's no chance the people you pick aren't amazing. 
So I reduce it to six, and then they have to make the final decision. And so I think that's a heavy burden and a lot of work. So I'd like to ask our awards and recognition committee to stand. Of course, they're standing. Of course, you're standing. You're, t you're too good. OK. Uh, I, it's also uh, special. I'd like to thank um, our past winners who are, have come back to join us, because the event is that good. Uh, so this is Carla Pugh. And uh, that's very subtle. Just the little wave. I think you're supposed to stand up and I'm here. <laughs> Ide Rodriguez. Pia Sorkar. And Gary Mukai, who is always with us. So thank you for coming back. It's great. And uh, at the end, you can't leave, ever. No, we, we have to take a photo with everyone. Uh, I'd also really like to thank uh, Angela and David Philo and the Yellow Chair Foundation, who, who championed this award and sponsored it. And uh, they're incredibly committed to education and working with those who are underserved students. So it's an inspiration to all of us. And finally, I'm proud that you're all here uh, to honor these educators. So uh, to, I'm going to move to the awards now. And uh, here, here's how it's going to happen. Uh, I am the introducer of the introducer. And I will be introducing four times four introducers who will introduce. So, so it's a, it's a lovely, ch lovely chain. And our introducers are incredible as well. And so our first will be Professor Emerita Milbury McLaughlin. So I don't, I don't know how many of you have been lucky enough to have a class with Milbury. Uh, so the thing that's amazing about her is she can work a crowd like nobody's business. So someone will say something, someone else will say something, someone else will say something. She said, well, you know, what you said is just like what that person said, which is an amazing thing to do online in front of lots of people. So Milbury first met Alex as a poll student in her policy class. Uh, she noted that her energy and insight took the center stage from day one. Milbury has followed her amazing career since she left Stanford, watching Alex channel the same energy, insight, and personal commitment into developing productive pathways for low-income students of color. So Milbury, please. I now feel obliged to work the room. <laughs> It is, a, this, you're right, Dan, this is the best of the best. Um, what a wonderful gathering. And I thought, I don't think anybody's going to come. And here you all are. And I've just used up 15 seconds of my two minutes. <laughs> it is such a treat to introduce Alex. And I'm going to tell a little bit of the story that, that Dan told about Alex. Um, she was not only the first, she is the first Poles honoree, but is of the first Poles class. And, Alex was one of the first students into my first policy class, and she came in, and here was this person who came in five minutes early to sit down in the chair right in front of me, and here was this energy and just commitment, and that's who this person is. I mean, Alex, Alex is just astonishing. Um, so I met her as a student in my policy class, and we've kept up with each other over the years through our mutual interest in underserved students, Alex in particular in higher education, and me mainly in K-12. Alex is the founder, and you'll hear more about this, of uh, Beyond 12, which reflects her own experience of um, getting through college, trying to get through college, and stumbling along the way. Alex was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And she lived there until she was seven. She stayed with her granny while her mom and dad went to Boston to kind of try to make way for the, for the family. And at seven, Alex came to Boston. And her mom at that time was a blood technician, is this correct? In a Boston hospital. And mom was standing around listening to a bunch of doctors talk, as I often do, about where their kids are going to go to college. And they talked about the Ivy League, and then they talked about Dartmouth. And Alex's mom said, that's where Alex is going. 
So Alex went to Dartmouth. <laughs> Dartmouth didn't go well for Alex. Small things and big things. Um, the first, I think, is just emblematic. On the first day that Alex and her family arrived in Hanover, they discovered she had the wrong size sheets. This is a big deal. You have the wrong size sheets. Yeah. <laughs> Not the long ones, the short ones. And Alex struggled at Dartmouth and just about flunked out in her first year. Um, so she was advised to take a year off, which she did. But being Alex, she came back with a game plan about working with faculty and working with mentors and finished in four years as a sociology major. So she struggled, and out of that struggle came Beyond 12. Um, Beyond 12, happy birthday. It's now 10 years, 2009. Yeah, right. Yay. Um, Alex will tell, you more, will tell you more about the program, um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about Alex in terms of her own involvement. What she asked herself was, what could I have done differently at Dartmouth? What could Dartmouth have done differently? What were some supports and things that I needed at Dartmouth? And out of that came Beyond 12, which was incubated at New Futures. Is that correct? So she was Entrepreneur of the Year. And out of this entrepreneurship came this amazing program about which you'll hear more. Alex has had much recognition for this. Um, Beyond 12 was named one of the world's top 10 most innovative companies in education. The New Schools Venture Fund named Alex Entrepreneur of the Year. That was when you were founding Beyond 12, I assume. Alex became an Achoka Fellow in 2012, and this honors social entrepreneurship. She received the Jefferson Award for Public Service. And I like this one. In 2018, Vanity Fair featured Alex as one of the 26 women entrepreneurs of color who have raised more than a million dollars um, of outside funds to support. So. Um, I will never forget my first day of seeing Alex in the middle of the front row. Um, and we have been colleagues and friends since then. And I'm so proud to honor you with the GSE <coughs> Alumni Award of Excellence. Congratulations. <laughs> wow. Hello, everyone. It is such an honor to be here tonight. Milbury, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for championing me and the work of Beyond 12 from the very beginning. While I was at Stanford, you taught me to always consider the policy levers that we needed to pull in order to ensure that we could break through the systems, right? To ensure that our students, particularly those most underserved by our educational institutions, <clears throat> would be able to thrive. Your lessons and your insights have stayed with me, and I continue to use them daily as I try to grow beyond 12, always centered around the students that we're serving. So thank you so much, Milbury. I also want to thank Dean Schwartz, members of the Alumni Awards and Recognition Committee, as well as the Alumni Relations staff. Thank you so much for this honor. And of course, what an honor it is to be counted with you, my fellow honorees. I was trying not to have a fangirl moment, right, as I was taking pictures with you. Um, but to be in this group and to be counted among my, some of my education superheroes is really awesome. So thank you. As all of you know, we don't do the work that we do on our own. I stand on the shoulders of giants. And some of those giants are in the room today. My support system, my caravan, the people who allow me to do this work. So I want to first start by thanking my hubby and my son, Lucas, the two people who are sacrificing the most <laughs> to allow me to have this dream. Thank you, sweetie. My mom and dad are here. They flew in from Florida to be here with us today. And my beautiful niece, Alani, who came with them. She's here as well. And there are so many supporters. I also want to thank members of the Beyond 12 Board of Directors who nominated me originally for this award. I see Natasha here, and our board chair, Renuka Kerr, is here. So thank you so much. 
And I could go down the list and list people by name, but it's going to take too long, so I'm going to try not to do that. But to all members of, of the caravan that supports me and that holds me, members of the village, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for allowing me to live this dream and this opportunity. So it's a privilege to stand here with you today because the GSE is where my story comes full circle. It was not a foregone conclusion that I would be standing here on this stage, or any stage for that matter. As you heard from Milbury, I am an immigrant. I am a first generation college graduate. I am a Pell Grant recipient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and English was my third language. <clears throat> But here I am, standing in front of you today as a GSE alum, as a social entrepreneur who has created an organization that is supporting 50,000 students and who aspires to support a million students annually by 2025. As Milbury alluded, <laughs> I had a very difficult transition from high school to college. And at some point, it looked like my dreams of earning a college degree would not be achieved. Luckily, I was able to turn things around with the support of my family, some of my amazing peers represented by my friend who's here today, and mentors. I was able to regain my footing. As Milbury mentioned, I came back with a new game plan. And I was able to graduate from Dartmouth in four years. While my story has a happy ending, though, each year, hundreds of thousands of students with backgrounds and stories similar to mine embark on their college journeys, believing, like I did, that they are prepared for the road ahead. But the statistics tell us otherwise. We all know it. We're in this room, right? Only 9% of students from the lowest income quartile can expect to earn a bachelor's degree by their mid-20s versus 77% of their higher income peers. Think about the gap between 9% and 77%. So I came to the GSE determined to change those statistics. <clears throat> While I was here, I took a class called Leading Social Change, taught by two other amazing professors Deborah Myerson, who was here earlier but who couldn't stay, <clears throat> and Kim Smith. It was in this class that I first heard the phrase social entrepreneurship. And it's where I learned about leading social entrepreneurs like Mohammed Yunus, the founder of Grameen Bank, who pioneered the field of microfinance. And our professor, Kim Smith, was a social entrepreneur in her own right having founded an organization called New Schools Venture Fund. It was in this class, inspired by Kim's example and support, that I started to dream big. I started to believe that I, too, could create an organization that would impact millions of students. At the end of this class, we were asked to write a My Mountain letter, describing our hopes and identifying the mountains that were standing in the way of achieving our dreams. We were told that this letter would be mailed to us a year after graduation. It was a nice task. I completed it, but you know, quite frankly, forgot about it. Life got busy, got a job, graduated. One day, though, I went to my mailbox, and I saw a letter addressed to me in my own handwriting. I was a little confused, but I opened the envelope. And I read my own words, the very words I needed to hear. Alex, if you aren't on the path to becoming a social entrepreneur and starting your own organization, it is because you are afraid. You will always think that you need more. You need more preparation. You need to better understand the landscape. But please don't let your fear continue to be your mountain. You are ready for this moment. Don't be a chicken. 
<laughs> you are ready. You're ready now. That letter prompted me to become an entrepreneur in residence at New Schools Venture Fund. And it was, it was during the residency that I created the business plan for Beyond 12. And we launched the organization officially in 2010. Ten years later, I'm pleased to say that Beyond 12 is thriving. Working in partnership with high schools and colleges, our coaching platform, which combines virtual human coaches, a campus-specific mobile app, and a back-end analytics engine, powered by machine learning that allows us to predict which students need our help and when, and then prescribe the right type of support. We have provided critical support to more than 7,000 students from under-resourced communities. And our students are persisting and graduating at rates that far surpass the national averages for similar students. We're currently serving 50,000 students, and we aspire to serve a million students annually by 2025. It was here at the GSE that I learned not only to dream big, but to also look at the root cause of all of these challenges. I learned to look critically at the systems that were producing inequitable outcomes for students like me. It is my GSE foundation that allows me to see that though we like to say this, our education system isn't broken because systems achieve the outcomes they are designed to achieve. To produce different outcomes, to truly achieve equity, we have to do more than prepare our young people to succeed in the system as we know it today. We have to prepare them to question that system, deconstruct it, and build a new one. One that is specifically deliberately, intentionally designed to deliver equitable outcomes for all students. The GSE is where I learned that lesson. Before I wrap up, I just want to talk to the students who are in this room. Where are you, students? How many of you are here? OK. <laughs> it's nice to have you here. I came to Stanford a little bit academically broken. I wasn't sure I could do it. Things hadn't gone well for me while I was at Dartmouth. So I came here feeling like an imposter, even though I didn't act like one, obviously, in Milbury's class. I didn't feel like I belonged. So to all of you, I want to say, you belong. You deserve to be here. You deserve all of the accomplishments that you have achieved. If you have a dream, <laughs> if you have a dream, please do not let fear stand in your way like I almost did. If you want to start something, do it. If you spend your days contemplating a career change to tackle a problem, take a shot. Whether it's research, whether it's practice, you can do it. You have the skills. You are prepared. And if you're already going to do something, think big and do it bigger. You are ready for this moment. Go move your mountains. I promise you that the GSE has more than prepared you for your journey. Thank you so much for this incredible honor. And thank you, Milbury. Thank you to my nominators. Natasha, I'm looking at you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so now uh, I get to introduce uh, 
Professor Emerita Rachel Lotan. So Rachel and I, I had one of my great joys at the GSE is that we co-taught the pro seminar, which is a very tough class to teach. And uh, a little bit competitive. It felt like American Idol <laughs> to see who was going to get voted off first. Uh, but we made it together. So thank you, Rachel. Uh, so all of our STEP alumni and students already know about our next introducer. She's beloved. Uh, Rachel Lotan met Irene when she applied to STEP as a recent Brown graduate. Irene's application stood out because she had such a clear vision about why and how she wanted to be a teacher. They stayed in close contact after she graduated. Rachel was deeply honored to be asked to introduce her tonight. So thank you, Rachel. You can see me, right? <laughs> I thought I needed a special microphone, but I don't. Um, I promised not to cry, but I've been known not to keep my promises. Okay. Um, as Dan said, um, I met Irene Step 2010 uh, through her Step application. And um, I found out that she had wanted to be a teacher since she was in kindergarten. And she has the drawing her mom kept for her to prove that. What stood out in that application was, and I quote, teaching is a reciprocal process. Teachers have to be willing to learn from their students. I fully intend to enter my graduate study with this philosophy. I want to be able to learn from the students. She continued to say, actually, she's learning from everybody else, too. But <laughs> She knew she wanted to be a teacher. She knew how she would get there. And she also knew what kind of teacher she wanted to be. She has been, and she is. You are. That kind of teacher for the students, and now a teacher of teachers. On the second day of uh, STEP uh, summer school, which is the second week, Irene's cooperating teacher, Jeff Camarillo, where are you? There you are. Came to my office and informed me we have a star. <laughs> that same week, Sam Weinberg, and those of you who know Sam Weinberg know that he doesn't dole out praises <laughs> as easily, stopped by my office to tell me that Irene is a star. So I guess we had a star. The next primary source, because it's all about history, right, Irene? <laughs> the next primary source I would like to cite from is Irene's summary reflection <laughs> for her graduation exhibition. Her students and her special connection with them are at the center. By the way, it has been on my computer since 2010. My students this year have taught me that teaching is about the human connections, about building relationships with students to know their interests, struggles, hopes, and dreams, so that I may know how to better serve them. I had mentioned my teachers labeling me as the, quote, exception to the rule, because she was a Brown graduate. My students are proof that I was not just the exception. Another primary source <laughs> to quote from is uh, from one of the letters of recommendation I wrote for, on behalf of Irene. And this is what I said. I said, from the first few weeks of the program where I wrote, Irene stood out in her intellectual engagement her love of learning, her diligence, thoughtfulness, and the depth of her work. 
her commitment to the profession, her caring relationships with her students and her colleagues, her respectful interactions with the cooperating teacher and university supervisor, her outstanding work ethic were exemplary. She earned the respect of her professors, her teacher colleagues, and her, the administration of the school where she student taught, which was East Palo Alto Academy, where she student taught. She was beloved by her high school students. The letter is pretty long. <laughs> you can tell, right? Um, and I used um, the following adjectives, honest, ethical, considerate, well-organized, well-spoken, high-achieving. There were more words around that. Uh, I also, this is a quote, I observed her classroom and was deeply impressed by the rigor of the students' work, their engagement and active participation. Her firm yet caring authority emanates and creates a powerfully productive environment. I observed her classrooms at East Palo Alto Academy often. And uh, when Ruth Ann and I, where are you, Ruth Ann? OK. When Ruth Ann and I decided it was time for her to become a cooperating teacher and mentor a student teacher, Irene was hesitant. She said, oh, I'm not ready, not yet. Give me another year. Uh, so Ruthann and I said, oh, don't worry. We think you are ready. So we're going to give you two graduate <laughs> students, two student teachers to supervise. And Colin, you remember those days, right? Um, Irene um, uh, was the founding dean of students with Jeff as principal at Lu Luis Valdez Latino Academy set a standard that will be hard to meet. And um, I think that your professional partnership and your personal friendship continues. Uh, Irene um, also collaborated with another member of the family, Professor Al Camarillo, as they developed a new course and um, I visited LVLA quite a few times and conducted my own survey. And I asked students about their favorite class. There was no exception, 100% of my survey. That doesn't happen, right? <laughs> Ever. Uh, all the students I asked about their favorite class was Mexican American history class. And um, Irene introduced me to one of the students, of her students, uh, earlier this evening. And that student, whose name, sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> he said that that course changed his life. And I think there are many of those around here. So as Irene continues to learn to write, to support her colleagues and her students, um, I think her impact on the lives of those students is amazing. My closing sentence in my letter of recommendation was, I expect Irene to become a leader in the field of education. And I was right. And she's one, indeed. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here today. As Rachel mentioned, I do love primary sources. So when brainstorming the remarks of tonight's um, evening, I went back to my own primary sources. And actually, I have some of the primary sources that Rachel alluded to. So I'm a very visual learner, so here we go. Um, but this is, sorry. Uh, this is the drawing of my Kinder book, um, where Kinder Me 
as you can see, wanted to be a teacher, right? And as I was looking at my primary sources, I love pictures as well, also a primary source. So I looked and I found this picture. <laughs> So in thinking about these two pictures side to side, right, I had a couple of reflections. So one of them is six-year-old me could predict an outfit I would eventually wear, which is pretty amazing, primary colors. Um, but also, I thought about six-year-old me, kinder me, um, and thinking that I wanted to be a teacher. And I now stand before you as 33-year-old me, and I know that my dream job is being a teacher. Yes. yes. <laughs> and as I look at both of these pictures, I thought the best part of teaching is missing in both. Right? And that is my students. And so when I wrote the remarks, I thought about the lessons that they have taught me over the last 10 years in my educational career. And I'd like to share some of those lessons with you tonight. Lesson number one, teach students to read the world, to change the world. Inequitable and racist educational structures lead to painful internalization of inf inferiority and lost opportunity. Therefore, it is necessary to affirm students for all that they are and all that they bring into our classrooms. But please don't stop there. Our students need more than just being assigned competency. Go further and support teachers to provide students with the critical lens that they need to read the world around them and allow them to question and dismantle the institutions that make them doubt their greatness. As a great Paulo Freire states, reading the world always precedes reading the word and reading the word implies continually reading the world. When social justice leaders are led by these ways of knowing, they are better able to invest in their teachers and help them to build an analysis that subsequently gives students the permission to do the same. These best practices are what many have showed lead to the dismantling of oppression. Lesson number two, teaching is a political act. Privilege is an inherent part of our current social order. And as educators, we must own that some people are afforded certain privileges that others are not. Aside from my, what may be some of my obvious privileges that come to mind, such as holding numerous college degrees, my bilingualism, and a career that I love dearly, my privilege also consists of a nine-digit social security number that allows me to cross intellectual and geographical borders. This is a privilege that our society continuously, it continues to arbitrarily deny that privilege from students and families that you likely see each day, including many of my own family members. This too is part of my journey. This too is, is part of the millions of K through 12 students' journeys. So in thinking about our own educational journeys, it's important that we continuously reflect on our own education, on our own positionality and privilege, and acknowledge that who we are is just as relevant in, educa in education in, as in who our students are. And I am a daughter of immigrants from Mexico, Celedonio and Consuelo Castillon. Thank 
familia, mi familia y las familias de mis estudiantes que están aquí. Este es nuestro logro. I often say that I teach history to make history. And I stand before you making history as today's recipient of the first Early Career Award winner from the GSE at Stanford University. <laughs> A proud daughter of immigrants did that. Lesson number three, do what you do with and for community. Relationships continue to be at the center of my educational philosophy and practice. And this is an educational philosophy that was very much shaped in STEP. The relationships that I have built in STEP have allowed me to cultivate the relationships that I now have with students, with fellow educators, and with mentors. It is a relationship that I built with my summer cooperating teacher, Jeffrey Camarillo, that allowed me to step out of my comfort zone and help lead and help found a school when I didn't think that I could. It is a relationship that I built with my former steppy, Marilyn Travis, and fellow step colleague, Sonia Jimenez, two teachers that I continue to learn from and be inspired from and forever grateful to that, led them to, that led them to make time to write letters of support for my nomination, even in the busy month, teacher month of April. It is relationships that remind me that to teach is to learn. And I definitely still have a lot to learn, but I am so thankful that all of you are part of my educational journey. It is relationships that remind me that I have the greatest teachers, my students. Relationships that extend beyond graduation that motivate students to be here on a Friday night to support their former teacher. Lesson number four, remember your purpose. For me, a driving force each time I enter my classroom is the thought that my students will one day be in a classroom like this. Reminding them that even if it makes others uncomfortable, that they deserve and are capable of sitting in a college classroom. They will define the much needed shift from exception to rule. Some of these students are here today and I'm gonna ask them to please stand. Don't be shy, please stand. Thank you. I want to thank you for being my pockets of resistance and for teaching me to lead with the heart of love and the heart of activism. I cannot wait to see all that you will accomplish and the multi-generational impact that you will have because you are the new status quo. Thank you. teacher, <laughs> I'll tell you. So uh, the third introducer is Emerita Professor Arnitha Ball, who holds the Duke Homans chair. So Arnitha, you and I, we've known each other for 20 years, it, and we've kind of had a quirky friendship. Yeah, I think so, but it, you've been a great ally, and it's been my great pleasure. 
So Professor Arnitha Ball met our next honoree for the first time when Arnitha was a student here and Dr. Ladson Billings was a visiting scholar. The title of Dr. Ladson Billings' talk was Like Lightning in a Bottle. So Arnitha, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Like lightning in a bottle. Picture it, if you will, a bolt of lightning trapped inside of a glass bottle under the control of the person, I mean, who's holding the bottle. Amazing, isn't it? Well, that's the picture that comes to mind every time I think about my colleague and my friend, Dr. Gloria Latson Billings. It was the first talk that I ever heard her give. And she gave it here at Stanford University when I was a graduate student. I just started here and I uh, heard she was giving a talk. And boy, did I learn a lot. I learned that she was a powerful thinker and a powerful speaker, a powerful scholar. And she's been inspiring me ever since. That talk was about the magnificence, the beauty, and the grace of teachers who have the ability to be successful teachers of African American students. She was studying, uh, trying to capture the pedagogical excellence of successful teachers of African American students. These are the dream keepers. And ladies and gentlemen, I found out very soon, very soon, that she herself was a dream keeper as well. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to introduce you, uh, to introduce Dr. Gloria Ladson Billing. Uh, yes, the recipient of the award tonight. She received her doctorate uh, in curriculum studies and teacher education in 1984 wow. uh, from Stanford University and a minor in anthropology. She's based currently at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but she has also uh, been a groundbreaker in terms of research on culturally relevant pedagogy, and critical race theory in education. She has served as an assistant vice chancellor of academic affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has served as the Keller Family Distinguished Chair in Urban Education. She has served as the president of the American Education Research Association, a research association with over 25,000 members, the largest research association in the world. And she has recently uh, been elected president of the National Academy of Education. Yeah, I could go on and on and on and on, but I think you get the point. She is no stranger to being the recipient of awards. I could go on forever. But of course, you could read about that on Google. So I, I, I'm going to move on from there. And I want to take you someplace else. I want you, I want to leave with you. When I think about Dr. Ladson Billings, uh, a few ideas come to mind, a few quotes and a question come to mind. And so I'm going to leave those with you. Um, the ideas that I'm sharing for you are just a sampling of the talks that she has given internationally throughout the United States. As I say, she's a powerful speaker, and uh, I love to hear her uh, give um, uh, research uh, talks. So one of the talks that she gave, the title of it was, It's Not the Culture of Poverty, It's the Poverty of Culture in teacher education programs, that's the problem. That's interesting. Think about it, <laughs> OK? Something else I'd like you to think about is that she says that teacher education has challenges even in elite university settings. 
And one of those challenges is the development of critical perspectives for teachers uh, and their thinking about democratic and multicultural societies. We have to continue to contemplate those ideas. And one that uh, has revolutionized the way we think about education for minoritized um, um, population was her work on um, from the achievement gap to the education debt, understanding the achievement in U.S. schools. The, her work in that area revolutionized the way that we think about the education debt rather than gap. Two quotes that, um, uh, that I, I found that uh, Dr. Lassen Billings has uh, made. She said, culturally relevant teaching is about questioning and preparing students to question the structural inequality, the racism, and the injustice that exists in society. And she studies teachers who work in opposition to systems that employ them. That's powerful. We all need to be working toward that. Another quote, it said, um, I really feel energized by this new generation of students. And so do I, Dr. Letts and Billings. People are now thinking about schools differently and thinking about learning differently and using new technologies. And she feels that it's all very exciting. Well, I've given you some ideas and some quotes, and I'd like to leave you with a question. I find it so exciting, and I'm enjoying so much the work that Dr. Lassen Billings is doing and the success that she's experiencing, not only because she works so hard and deserves the success, but also because of the far-reaching impact of her work. She's revolutionized research. Um, in education. And so the question I'd like to leave with you is, is she not a phenomenal woman? <laughs> I give you Gloria Latson Billings. It's always good to have your friends be your introducers, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Arnitha. We do go back a ways. I want to thank uh, Dean Swartz. I certainly want to thank my fellow uh, awardees. And I'm so excited to be in this room with so many friends. Uh, I see Chris Gutierrez here, who came down from Berkeley. Thank you, Chris. Um, I've got my uh, sorority sisters are here. I saw you all here. Way to represent. Uh, it is a delight to be here and, and to be in this room and to be back at Stanford. Um, I wrote my remarks a little less than 24 hours after I sent my first set of remarks to the awards committee. My previous remarks were well thought out and reflected my thoughts about my time at Stanford. However, early on the morning of October 17th, I was walking into the airport to catch a flight to New Orleans. And I received an alert on my phone and assumed it was the airline telling me that either my flight was delayed or that the gate had changed. Instead, it was a news alert telling me that longtime Maryland Congressman Elijah Cummings had died. That news rocked me. I went over to take a seat to read the details, which at that early morning time were sketchy. And I sat for a moment and thought about the tremendous impact that Congressman Cummings had made on the nation, on his constituents, and me personally. And immediately I began to think of something that a former Stanford Alumni Excellence winner Dr. Joyce King once gave a talk on, the responsibility of privilege. Attending Stanford is indeed a privilege. It is a privilege whether one arrives here from a long line of Stanford alums 
or represents a first generation collegiate or graduate student. Having the Stanford imprimatur means something. Yes, GSE is filled with intelligent, creative, and innovative thinkers who will do great things. But some of us just stumbled into that greatness. So no matter how we move from Stanford to the academy or other educational institutions, the question that comes from that position of privilege is what responsibility do we leave here with? The distinction of a Stanford Graduate School of Education degree is not merely what you will do, but rather what you must do. My Stanford education gave me a wonderful set of analytic research tools. It gave me a way to think about problems and how I might solve them. It gave me important insights into theory and how theory, which the late Elliot Eisner once told me, is nothing as practical as a good theory, Gloria. <laughs> but how that theory could help us plan systematic approaches to our work and provide more powerful explanations to education phenomena. What Stanford and no graduate preparation um, could not do was to give me an assignment. Our assignments come from our deep and enduring commitments. My commitment came from my knowledge that the persistent inequities that I had witnessed both as a student in Philadelphia and later as a teacher in the city were baked into the system. A system that has several leverage points that might be amenable to intervention. We could intervene in classrooms. We could intervene in schools. We could intervene in school districts. And those interventions could come with teachers, with curriculum, with social relations, with school organization, school finance, governance, and or policy. So Stanford taught me that there were plenty of places where I might push the elephant known as disparity. Being at Stanford can often be unsettling for those of us who began our journey in very modest settings. Having graduated from college meant I had already exceeded my parents' aspirations for me. They could not see what value graduate education would add if I weren't going to be a physician, an attorney, or a Wharton MBA like my brother. What can keep us from losing sight of what it means to be, a graduate school of be at the Graduate School of Education is to be mindful that the education one is seeking is never an individual commodity. It is never just about one person. Every time I walked on this campus, I walked on with the hopes, the dreams, and the aspirations of hundreds of thousands of African-American students who called my hometown of Philadelphia their home. And when my career began to flourish, I realized that I researched, wrote, and published for millions of students, K-12, collegiate, and graduate. On days when I felt discouraged, it only took an email or a note from a graduate student, often someone I'd never met that said, because of you, I've been encouraged to do work that challenges the status quo and affirms the experiences and lives of African Americans. This is, what, this, this is when I feel like I am living up to the responsibility of my privilege. In my 32 years as an academic, 26 of them at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, I have sat across the desk from many graduate students of color who were at a place of discouragement. And for the graduate students in the room, incidentally, all of you will be at that place. <laughs> that, that comes with the territory. And they don't put it in the brochure, but that's coming. <laughs> but after I listened closely to their complaints, often legitimate, 
I calmly asked them, what makes you think this is about you? You can imagine that many of them look at me with shock and dismay. But I always say, this is not just about you. It is about that eighth grade student of color from your hometown who does not believe she or he can even graduate from high school. Your completing this work tells them just what is possible. You cannot let them down. This is the responsibility of privilege. Being a Stanford alumna is an honor and a privilege. It has opened doors and allowed me a platform on which to raise both critical and uncomfortable questions. It's also challenged me to ask whether such an experience is only for a select few. What is it that every graduate school of education graduate should take on the responsibility of doing? I've just wrapped up a 26 year career at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And despite the awards and achievements, I believe I am most proud of my record with students. I have supervised 51 dissertations. Mm. 21 of them black women. This is not an accident. Being at Stanford taught me how important it is to create an atmosphere of care for all of our students. And my sincerest hope is that the Graduate School of Education will be the place that attracts students of color because of a reputation for treating them with kindness and care. In turn, I believe that those students will live out their responsibility of privilege. Thank you. So we have had an amazing social entrepreneur. We've had an amazing teacher. We've just had an amazing leader. Now we're going to have a professor's professor. So thus far, we have had retired faculty introducing students. Now we're going to have a student introduced to retired faculty. So Heather Kirkpatrick will introduce our lifetime achievement winner. Heather is the president and chief executive officer of Alder Graduate School of Education. She earned her PhD here. We're very proud of her. She got her master's from Harvard GSE. Not so proud. And, <laughs> and, her, and her BA from Barnard. We all, we all know which of her alma maters is her favorite. So today, Heather continues leading what began in 2009 as a pilot to develop teachers and principals through a residency model at Aspire Public Schools. Tonight, Heather is here as a former student of Larry Cuban's. They have remained close friends, like so many of his former students, for over the past 20 years. And a fun fact, Heather met her husband in one of Larry's classes at Stanford. <laughs> he was the TA, so... Uh, <laughs> so, so there's a special place in Heather and her husband's heart for Larry. So Heather... So. What a lovely night. Uh, all of you who know Larry know it is an amazing honor to get to introduce him and a uh, real delight to get to be here to honor Alex and Gloria and Irene. Um, Larry and I have been going to lunch together for 20 plus years now, uh, many times a, a year. And at our most recent lunch, I asked Larry, is there anything you'd like me to say tonight uh, in my introduction of you? And his one request was, uh, that there be no superlatives. <laughs> so I cannot tell you that he is one of the most accomplished historians of education. 
And I cannot tell you what an exceptional pedagogue he is. And I cannot tell you he is one of my superhero scholars. And I don't think he wants you sitting here thinking of him in little superhero tights and a superhero cape. So I'm not going to say that either. No superlatives. Larry likes rigorous scholarship even in his introductions. <laughs> so three things to highlight about Larry. The first, of course, is his scholarship. Larry is a true scholar, ever curious, constantly wondering and asking and working on something, and renowned. I wrote this so I would make sure I'd say it renowned for his dogged focus on evidence, on what can be proven. He has researched, of course, dozens, um, published dozens of articles, researched dozens of books, uh, given countless public lectures, and has blogged for an adoring crowd for 10 years now. He just had his blog's 10-year anniversary. His insights in all of these forums have not only shaped what we think, so many of us in this room, but how we think, of course. His focus on the facts lens on technology helps us cut through the hype. And his interest in peeling back the layers between policy and practice focus us all on a very important question that too often is missed. And of course, Larry, along with David Tayak, gave us Tinkering Toward Utopia. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, yes. Harvard Educational Review wrote, it is a brief and masterful overview of 100 years of school reform in the United States. The reviewer goes on, and this is his superlative, not mine. <laughs> no one has done it better. And I agree. Which brings me to my second highlight, Larry's teaching. So I took Larry and David's class, as you heard. It was one of the first classes I took here at Stanford. And on the very first uh, assignment, they asked us to write a paper. And the paper was to describe a policy becoming a practice, whether effectively or not. And they said, write this paper with a particular lens, individual, political, sociological, I wrote a scathing paper from an individual lens. I worked very hard on it. I was very proud of it. Turned it in. And that moment you turned in the paper, the uh, next thing that came, and many of you in this room probably remember this, write it again. And this time from another lens. And it was one of the hardest things I had to do. And it was one of the most important lessons for me and something that I have continued to bring with me into my thinking about the complexity of K-12 public schools and that it's never really about one individual. Larry won Teacher of the Year here at Stanford at least seven times. And I know, I know, that's something else, Larry. And I know it had something to do with the way he shows up outside of class. Many of us went on epic bike rides with Larry to the ocean and back. Yes, yes, woot woot. Many of us went to Passover dinners with Barbara and Sandra and Janice. Uh, we've heard stories of Pittsburgh and Barbara Ciela. But of course, what really earned Larry those teaching awards was how you made us focus and defend and find our own ideas. He also earned those awards because even though his rigorous lens that abides no folly, any of you who have been Larry's students know this, he abides no folly. But Larry is hopeful of the future of schools and ever believing in the power of great teachers. So lastly, there is a Yiddish word that means someone to admire, to emulate someone of noble character, integrity, and honor. Larry is the epitome of a mensch.
He has lived his life with integrity and focus and has not only expected those of us around him to do the same, but has inspired us to do so. We have to earn things. We have to prove our ideas. I want to say you earned this Lifetime Achievement Award, Larry. Well earned. I'm afraid everything is downhill after that. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Heather. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, my family. Uh, Sandra, Janice, and Barbara Ciella, are they here? Where they are? All right. All right. OK. And I have been uh, lucky and quite fortunate in all the friends. And one of the things that this award, this unanticipated uh, 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 consequence, is that I now see people that I haven't seen for many years. So uh, it has meant a great deal to me. And uh, I'm not going to break up into tears, but uh, it's been very moving to me. And so I appreciate that a great deal. Uh, two people who I wish were here tonight are not. Uh, they helped me become the person I am today, Barbara Cuban and David Tyak. Uh, I miss them a great deal. In these brief remarks, I want to talk about my career as a teacher scholar what this award means to me, and the importance of knowing about the past, particularly when it comes to school reform. My career path since I began teaching in 1955, whoa, whoa. <laughs> 1955, and uh, I was 20 years old at that time, and that's when I began teaching. That, my career has been unplanned and uncommon. I admit that up front. I had been a high school history teacher in Cleveland and Washington, D.C., for 14 years. While I have never been a school principal, I did work as an administrator in the D.C. school uh, district office. In that position, I came in frequent contact with uh, the superintendent I learned a lot about bureaucratic decision making and leadership while I was in that position. What I came to realize is that I could do that job. <laughs> you know, someone spoke about, Alex talked about being an imposter. You know, I was a teacher. And here I'm uh, meeting with the superintendent and my boss, you know, once or twice a week. And then I said, yeah, I could do that. Uh, yes, I was ambitious, but I didn't think that I could do that kind of a job. And after being there, I felt that I could. But I needed an advanced degree. So at the age of 37, I was one of the oldest um, graduate students in my cohort. I came to Stanford. I came only for one reason. I wanted to be a superintendent and I needed a doctorate. <laughs> David Tyack made it possible for Barbara, my daughters, and me to come here. Living in Escondido Village were great years for my family. David Tyack was my advisor. Uh, under him, I researched and completed a dissertation about three big city superintendents and in 1974, I got that degree. I see Mike cursed here. He was one of my teachers at that time. <laughs> and I'm much older than you, Mike. <laughs> I then applied for superintendencies. After 50 rejections, yes, 5-0. 
50 rejections, I was finally appointed superintendent in Arlington, Virginia. I served there for seven years, and I found it to be the most exhilarating and exhausting job I have ever had in my life. Certainly far more exhilarating, far more exhausting than being a professor. I returned to Stanford to teach after the superintendency. I wanted to teach, I wanted to do research, and I wanted to write. I did all of that for five years, and then applied for big city superintendencies across the nation. I was a finalist in every single big city I applied for, <laughs> but they didn't pick me. <laughs> Failing to become a big city superintendent was a big disappointment for me. I remained at Stanford. That wasn't a disappointment, but I remained at Stanford to teach, advise doctoral students, and write. What ties together my zigzag career is teaching. I taught in classrooms. I taught in schools in Washington and Cleveland and elsewhere. The teaching I did as a superintendent, and of course the teaching I did as a professor. This award for lifetime achievement, however, recognizes my scholarly work advising students and real life school experiences. I see myself today as a teacher scholar. Teaching, researching, and writing have been central to my journey, particularly around the issue of school reform. A few words about that never-ending American effort to improve schools. David Tyack and I taught a course. We also brokered a marriage <laughs> on the history of school reform. We taught it for a decade. Some of you have been in that course. History was central to our work. We believe that not knowing about past efforts to alter public schools is similar to individuals having amnesia. <laughs> Forgetting our past and how you became the person you are, if you forget that, forgetting your past, that's a tragedy. Not knowing how earlier generations of well-intentioned reformers tried again and again to improve public schools is a forgetfulness, an intellectual disaster that blinds and deafens those who think they know best how to make schools better. But teaching such a history to those graduate students in particular who see themselves as future reformers has a downside. Idealistic graduate students eager to improve schools often told us at the end of the course that studying decades of failed efforts <laughs> to reform schools depressed them <laughs> and it battered their idealism. They would often ask David and me, are you pessimistic about improving public schools? My answer was always no. I do have hope for the future of public schools. My optimism, however, is tempered and realistic. I would ask our students to compare improving schools to climbing a difficult mountain. See, the mountain metaphor is beautiful. <laughs> Responsible climbers would hire, would want a guide who has climbed the mountain before, knows where the crevices are, and, and where to step carefully. That accurate knowledge of the difficulties, that candor and humility are as crucial to teaching as it is to reaching that summit. Hope for success in both climbing a mountain 
and converting reform policies into classroom practices rest in expertise, problem solving, courage, and yes, a touch of luck. But, and this is an especially important but, climbing that mountain is still worth the effort, even if success is not achieved. Being realistic about the task is crucial. Realism and hope, then, are married in my mind. Although the history of, of reform shows clearly that schools, in my judgment, cannot transform society, competent and committed teachers can influence their students' minds, hearts, and actions. They have helped the young grow into adults who do work to reduce societal ills. That is the tempered, realistic optimism that I continue to have after six decades as a teacher scholar. Thank you to the committee for making this award. Thanks, Dan. Thank you all for coming to the Academy Awards. <laughs> We're glad you are here. Uh, this concludes our program. Please uh, enjoy yourself outside at the reception and the honorees and the past honorees. You still have some work to do up front. Thank you all.